Plan for America podcast is a show dedicated to national unity through prosperity that's achieved by free market capitalism. We believe that a rising tide does lift all boats. This show will be positive, solution-oriented, and nonpartisan. Our only agenda is for the prosperity of our country and her people. All are welcome here. This show will not be argumentative or incendiary, sensational or polarizing and divisive. What we are presenting is a positive solution to one of America's greatest problems. Hello and welcome to Plan for America podcast, coming to you from Dynamic Reality Technologies on the campus of Coastal Alabama Community College in Fairhope, Alabama. I'm your host, Eric Nager, and our special guest today is Dr. Alexander William Salter, who is a professor of economics at Texas Tech University and also a fellow Guns with up. Sound, Sound Money Project. Yes, that was the Texas Tech uh, Similar, the Red Raiders. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Salter. Eric, it's my pleasure. And if you could give our uh, our listeners and viewers, I mean, many may already know you from your excellent contributions to the Wall Street Journal, uh, but your educational background and your career up to this point. Sure. So I did my bachelor's degree in economics with also a minor in mathematics at uh, Occidental College, which is a small liberal arts school in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It became prominent about a decade ago because that's where Barack Obama spent a couple of his years before Columbia. Mm -hmm. And then I went uh, to the other coast, to Northern Virginia, where I did my master's and my PhD at George Mason University in economics. My first academic job was at a small liberal arts school about 90 minutes northwest of Atlanta called Barry College. And that was a really yes. great year. I had fun colleagues there. And then uh, after a year there, Texas Tech came and stole me away. And so I've been in Lubbock since 2015, and I'm loving it here. That's great. Well, tell us, um, please, what is uh, the Sound Money Project? Sure. So one of my positions and affiliations is I'm a senior research fellow with the Sound Money Project, which is under the auspices of the American Institute for Economic Research, based in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Uh, AIER is actually the nation's oldest economic think oh. tank. Okay, so well, you has... know, we had we had Greg Van Kipnis as a guest on the show. Oh, okay, that's interesting. He's the chairman of your board. That's that's great. Yeah. I haven't been to the mansion in a while, but uh, we, we bumped into each other once or twice in my, in my travels up to AIER. And so the Sound Money Project has not always been affiliated with AIER, but it got moved there a couple of years ago, five or seven years ago, I think. And it's run by my colleague, Will Luther, who is a professor of finance, uh, financial economics at Florida Atlantic University. He's also a co-author of mine on a recent Wall Street Journal piece, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And the Sound Money Project, as its name suggests, is devoted to issues of improving our monetary system and monetary institutions. Uh, we're not political. We don't endorse politicians. We don't endorse legislation. We don't endorse particular policy proposals. Instead, we want to take a step back and actually answer the question of what does the best contemporary academic research on money, money and banking and monetary institutions say about how we can fix the U.S. monetary system and by extension, the global monetary system? because the consensus is that there are some pretty serious flaws with the way things work right now. And there's no party line. We don't all necessarily agree on what the right solution is, but we all agree that careful economic scholarship can and should be brought to these issues. And so we write popular pieces for the AIER website, we write op-eds, and we try and engage the public on this crucial issue of sound money. It, it is a crucial issue. and. Um... Well, why don't we get to the piece that you wrote here about the lessons today from the Gold Standard, because we're right now, it's about 50 years exactly since President Nixon took us off the Gold Standard. What was the Gold Standard and why was it significant? That's the million dollar question. Yeah, so the Hass Centennial is a great time to revisit this issue of the Gold Standard, what it was and why we should care about it today. The tricky thing is there's no actual such thing as the Gold Standard. When you're saying gold standard, you could be talking about one of a half dozen very different institutional relationships for how the money supply is determined and what the banking system looks like. You could be talking about a gold coin standard where people are actually trading back and forth physical pieces of gold with each other. 
You could be talking about a free banking system where gold is the ultimate medium of redemption for bank liabilities. Most of the money supply, if not the entirety of the money supply, is privately created and issued by profit-seeking banks. And bank liabilities, including notes, checking deposits, savings accounts, those sorts of things, are redeemable in gold. But those bank liabilities actually constitute what we use as money for day-to-day -day exchange. So we're actually economizing on gold by trading liabilities redeemable in gold rather than gold itself. Sometimes people use the phrase gold standard to refer to what we prefer to call it the Sound Money Project, and this is also standard amongst monetary economists, the managed gold standard, which existed in the United States from 1914 until 1971, mm -hmm. which basically means a combination of gold-backed money plus a central bank that's supposed to manage the gold standard. Now, one of the great virtues of the gold standard is that it doesn't need to be uh, managed if it's an actual gold standard because there are automatic adjustment mechanisms that change the money supply in response to uh, alterations in money demand. And so I like to say that the gold standard and central banking are like oil and water. They don't mix and bad things happen when you try. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, some people have referred to the gold exchange standard as a gold standard, and so it behooves us to mention it. And then, of course, they could be talking about the peculiar kind of fixed exchange rate plus managed gold standard that we call the Bretton Woods system, which was the international monetary system from the end of the Second World War until Nixon finally axed that when he closed the gold window on August 15th, 1971. And the characteristics of that system was that major currencies in the world were pegged to the dollar. They weren't directly redeemable for gold. They were pegged to the dollar. And the dollar was the gold reserve currency in the sense that it was defined as worth so many dollars per ounce, but only foreign central banks could actually present dollars for redemption for gold. And uh, often the United States government put lots of informal pressure on foreign governments that tried to redeem their dollars for gold. And so there's a lot of politics in this as well. All of those things could be called the gold standard. Obviously, I have my strong preferences as to which kinds of those systems was best and which one I would like to see again or something like it. And the point of the Wall Street Journal piece that Will and I wrote was really to rehabilitate, despite its many imperfections, the performance of the gold standard in the US compared to the pure fiat money era. Because when you actually just go back and look at the historical data, the time series that we have, as imperfect as the gold standard was, fiat money is worse. Oh, yeah. No, I know there were problems with it. You, you might be interested to know that uh, on my honeymoon, I went to the Bretton Woods Hotel and stayed in the room of the Cuba delegate. So uh, I have a bit historic ties there. It's a very nice hotel. But anyway, I guess what I meant by asking that was that you know, we had a, uh, a, a fiscal discipline for our dollars that was removed mm. in 1971. And so what are the ramifications of moving that? Where are we today with our monetary policy? It seems like our central bank is just flooding the system with liquidity that is leading to inflation and other bad outcomes. So what's your, your take on the situation as it is today? I think you hit the nail on the head, and it all comes down to the fact that you can print paper, but you can't print gold. Mm -hmm. So the lack of a backing for the dollar means that fiscal policy is a lot looser than in previous generations. And if you have uh, some qualms about how the public sector allocates resources, that's not a good thing. And of course, monetary policy can be looser when the dollar isn't defined as a certain amount of gold or redeemable for a certain amount of gold. That removes an impediment to uh, significant monetary and fiscal expansion. Because normally, if you had to actually back up those fiscal and monetary policies with something like gold redemption or gold exchange, you just couldn't get away with it. There's much more of a loose joint in the fiscal monetary system under fiat money than there is under gold. Uh, I do want to emphasize though that the good thing about the gold standard, and we were talking about this earlier, the key thing about the gold standard isn't that it was gold, it's that the gold standard imposed rules and discipline on fiscal and monetary processes. So if you could find another way to impose that discipline, another set of rules that might mimic some of the results that we saw under the gold standard, that might be starting from where we are right now, the way to go, rather than make a political push for resuming the gold standard, right? This is an inherently prudential question. You can't answer a priori whether we should go back to gold or whether we should really try and tighten and strengthen fiscal and monetary rules. There are multiple paths forward that we can take to restore fiscal sanity and sound money. 
And I think at the end of the day, it's just about which ones are politically feasible and which ones pass the, uh, the sound political economy test. Well, can you maybe give an example of one that, that uh, could possibly work and what that might look like? Sure. I think that Congress can and should strengthen the rules that are actually binding the Fed's hands. So right now, the Fed has an inflation target. They recently switched mm -hmm. to an average inflation target, which basically means over a longer time horizon, they want inflation to average 2% per year. So the reason that that switch is important is if you're targeting inflation on average, that means if you fall short one year, you make up for it by going over it the next year. And on paper, that actually has some pretty desirable properties because it stabilizes the future path of the purchasing power of money, which means that if the Fed is good at its job, you know what the purchasing power of the dollar is going to be in 15, 20, 30 years, which makes long-term contracting a lot more feasible and a lot easier. And of course, long-term capital operations like that, uh, really thick, deep capital markets that are able to write those contracts are very important for economic growth. So you might be able to have Congress say, this rule sort of makes sense, but it's not good enough for the Fed to self-adopt the rule. Because if the Fed self-adopts the rule, it can ignore the rule whenever it wants to. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So right now the Fed only follows the rule because it wants to follow the rule. They've sort of had internal deliberations and said, this is going to be our policy. Much stronger would be Congress, the entity with the actual statutory authority to specify the goals for monetary policy to narrow the dual mandate, right now the Fed's only congressionally handed down goals are full employment and stable prices, which is far too vague. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, Congress can and should give the Fed a much more concrete goal rule that they have to follow that gives them a lot less wiggle room. And of course, fiscal and monetary rules are complementary, and so I would like to see that paired with something like a balanced budget amendment, right? A lot of people think mm -hmm. that, that, that that thing, uh, that institutional reform has come and gone, right? We had the opportunity way back in the 90s, perhaps, but it's not a live issue right now. Whether or not it's a live issue, it's something that we need, because the only thing we know for sure is that Washington won't restrain itself. So we have to find a way to make it politically feasible for politicians who spend our money to find it in their self-interest to commit to fiscal responsibility, because the evidence is in. They're not going to do it voluntarily. Well, and what happens, I mean, this may be an unknowable question, but what happens if we don't get off the path we're on right now? That's another tough question. So I'm actually a little bit surprised that bond markets don't seem to be currently worried by the US fiscal scenario. I'm worried by the current US fiscal scenario, but all the people yeah. with uh, skin in the game seem more than happy to continue to loan money to Uncle Sam on very favorable terms. As long as that happens, there's not gonna be any deleterious result or bad result following increased fiscal expansion, increased monetary expansion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The question is how long can that go on? It can't go on forever. Even under fiat money, right? At some point, the budget constraint has to bind. Yes. At some point, reality has to set in. So the question is, what does that look like? As interest rates start to go back up, which I expect that they will do as the economy continues to recover, mm -hmm. if interest rates go back up to historical averages, by 2030, half of all tax revenues are going to go to servicing the national debt. Yeah, That's an extraordinary amount of public resources that we have to devote just to paying yesterday's, yesterday's bills. And if interest rates go up by even a percent more than historical averages, for every generation, that's another 30 trillion added to the US's position in the red. So we're coming up to this situation, I think, that unless things significantly change going forward, unless we actually bite the bullet and start to take in those tax revenues necessary to service those fiscal expenditures rather than kicking the can down the road and making future generations deal with it, the unavoidable result of the arithmetic is just going to be we're going to have a compounding, increasing rate at which we have to devote public resources just to paying interest payments, just to service the debt that we already have. Yes. Right? And so right now, debt service costs compared to GDP are very low. And so that's why you see a lot of economists saying, see, we have nothing to worry about. What scares me is how sensitive that number is to increases in the interest rate. Even small in increases in interest rates cause the debt service cost of the United States government to go up very quickly. So yes. this is one of those things that oh, it looks okay today, but it's fragile. Not very much has to go wrong 
for there to be the threat of an actual fiscal crisis. And I know that economists with my kind of political economic sensibilities have predicted nine out of the last zero fiscal crises. Fair enough. <laughs> at, at some point, again, the budget constraint binds and bond markets aren't gonna put up with this forever. Right, and here's the other question is what happens if the dollar is no longer the reserve currency of the world? What happens to our standard of living then? That's going to be quite messy. I think uh, the switch to another currency as the backbone of the global financial system is going to be tumultuous. Asset markets aren't going to be happy at all simply because it's going to be a big, sudden, discontinuous change. And that's rarely yep. good for long-term capital investment and all these things that you need to keep equity markets afloat. There's no scenario in which a switch like that works well in the short run. Whatever the new equilibrium we transition to it's not going to be a smooth landing. If we want a smooth landing on all fronts, we need to start getting serious about these things now. Uh, unfortunately, it seems to be a bipartisan consensus in DC these days that fiscal responsibility and budgeting sanity is the thing of the past. Nobody seems to care about balancing the budget anymore. Nobody yeah. seems to care about controlling expenditure growth. Uh, that's something that I've, I've found very disappointing. We couldn't agree more, and that's actually a nice segue to our uh, break here, and then we'll come right back with uh, Dr. Salter after this. If you like what you're hearing and want to learn more about Plan for America, visit our website at www.planforamerica.us. There's an extensive Q&A section there, and if you don't see a question you have, then please ask us by email. You can order our book, Plan for America, how to place the American dream on a sure foundation forever that can be found on amazon.com. You can like us on Facebook. And if you really like what you're hearing, you can, you're welcome to contribute through our website. Plan for America is a nonprofit 501c3 organization and all contributions are tax deductible. And we're back with Plan for America podcast. I'm your host, Eric Nager, our guest. Dr. Alexander Salter from Texas Tech University and the Sound Money Project. And we've been talking about fiscal and monetary policy and his uh, excellent contributions to the Wall Street Journal talking about the um, so-called gold standard. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll refer to it as that. And um, what can be done. And his main point, I think, is that there has to be some discipline. There has to be discipline or Congress government will just spend money with no you know, concern really about the future and the future is going to be upon us here. That, that path is unsustainable. So let's talk about Plan for America because we see this as a way out of our fiscal difficulties. It's designed as a nonpartisan plan. We believe there are things in here that a true conservative would like, that a true liberal would like, a true libertarian would like. And talking about balancing the budget, you know, one thing we we our PhD, Dr. Latina, built an e economic model in conformity with CBO and Social Security Administration assumptions. And one of the things we weren't even thinking about in designing this, we we're just looking at the future, getting uh, you know out of debt and all that, re reforming the entitlement programs, taking them out of the hands of government so that the government can be relieved of the 150 plus trillion of unfunded liabilities but one thing that came out of the model, and I must emphasize this is pre-COVID federal budgets, but pre-COVID federal budgets to take Social Security and Medicare out of the federal budget, and all of a sudden you have pretty much a balanced budget right then. It would be very relatively easy to have a balanced budget going forward if those programs are off the government's plate. So um, your, your comments, uh, you said you read the white paper. What, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on Plan for America in terms of fiscal discipline? You're absolutely correct that the single largest source of fiscal peril for Americans is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Yes. All these programs that we thought we were going to be able to finance when they were first enacted due to various political and even more underlying than that demographic changes uh, just aren't going to fly going forward. And the political will doesn't seem to be there to do what's necessary on the tax side to actually make these programs solvent. So something absolutely has to be done. I, I definitely like the idea of privatizing these accounts and individualizing these accounts, which is a staple of the Plan for America project. 
that doing that introduces some responsibility. It better aligns incentives. I think that at the margin, steering those contributions that you make out of your paycheck towards those individualized accounts makes a lot of sense, right? There's a lot to like here that builds off of uh, 1990s efforts to privatize Social Security and even uh, efforts as recently as the second Bush administration to privatize Social Security. Right. So those, those sorts of things definitely need to happen. And you absolutely want to make use of the spectacular performance of asset markets compared to the rate of return that you're getting internal to the social security program. For sure. If I'm remembering correctly, the plan for America white paper was hyper conservative in assuming a 6.2% compounding rate of return on these assets that are invested on individualized accounts. That's correct. That's all the CBO allows us, right? That's what the CBO allows, right? So it's good to yeah. use that as a baseline. But then also in the appendix, it reran the numbers, assuming a rate of return that was closer to historical averages, just a little bit in excess of 10%. That is correct. Right. And so the, all of that looks really good in terms of when the plan actually moves from the red to the black, when in terms we actually unload those liabilities off the public sector balance sheet, and when it turns it to be an actual profitable program. So I think the arithmetic works out, and I think it's the right kind of plan that you want to, you want to focus your attention on. I also agree that if we were, if we could somehow get there, there would be a lot there that is acceptable across the political aisle to people of various ideological backgrounds. As the conclusion to the white paper noted, the big if is transition questions, right? It's always the transition. It's always the transition that'll get you, right? Being on the ground is fine. It's the fall to the ground that's going to hurt you. <laughs> so the path from A to B is precarious, and I think that that's something that we need to devote some attention to. But I don't think that it's a failing of Plan for America that it doesn't have a well-developed transition plan yet, because the very first thing that you have to do is sell people on the destination. You have to convince people yes. that this is where we want to go. That's always going to be the first step. So it's great that you've made a persuasive case about how that's done in terms of, look, this is the end result that we're looking to. This is the increased returns that you should be able to expect to see after a career working. Here's what we should expect to see to your health insurance premiums, right? If you're below this income threshold, you can even borrow against your contributions, right? Up to a certain amount to, to finance that in the short run. These are all sensible marginal reforms that make a lot of sense. The big issues for me in terms of incentive compatibility for politicians, one of them is if we were to enact this plan, we're talking about injecting trillions of dollars into asset markets, right? Not specific concerns, but broad-based index funds, something that would track Correct. the market as a whole. Would there ever be a scenario in which politicians would ever allow there to be a significant market correction in that kind of a future? Because someone's always going to be retiring, right? Someone's always yes. going to be needing those funds. So if for whatever reason there's a market correction and when we have every reason to think that those are just going to happen from time to time, right? Markets and people- They will. That's just the nature of the critter, right? So are politicians going to be able to exercise the restraint necessary not to artificially support asset markets, which completely ruins the signal that you get mm -hmm. from important pieces of financial information like the interest rate, the rate of return on capital, all these things that we need in order to have a profitable uh, economy. Um, I could see some progressive concerns about vesting this under a private institute or a private organization, right? Yeah. That's something that that progressives have have historically been skeptical of, and that was one of the big barriers to privatizing Social Security in the past. The idea that it would be private and would be filtered through private brokerage houses. At the end of the day, though, I'm not sure what alternative there is aside from that, because the whole point is to get this stuff off of Uncle Sam's books. That's right. So if it's going off Uncle Sam's books. Whose books is it going to go on? I guess you could conceivably have it be a nonprofit, but that comes with a host of incentive problems as well in terms of actually managing these assets and making sure that people's accounts are growing as the plan would suggest. So there are political hurdles, but I definitely think that this is a promising alternative in the range of feasible alternatives that we should be, we should be talking about. Well, I, I take that as high praise, sir, and I thank you for those comments. Um, just a couple of points to that. Um, you know, Plan for America, why it's a little different from any other plan, there is the funding mechanism, the 2% fee the trust takes to actually pay down the debt. So that makes it different from anything else right there. We're not inflating it away. We're actually going to pay it down. And depending, as you pointed out, on what assumptions you make about market returns, if enacted today, that would happen somewhere between 2054 and 2071. So that is, you know, a reasonable amount of time to do that. Uh, we looked at 
ideas in the past for partial privatization that you referred to. And we thought, what would make this better? And that's where we came up with the minimum guaranteed return that is backed by essentially the government. Um, even though the government is not part of this private trust, the government would pay the interest on the bonds as trust would float. So there is a minimum guaranteed return to combat a market uh, downturn. Also, there are mechanisms in there to prevent what's called the concept of drawdown. If your account gets too small, then it can't recover. And we initially, even before the model was built, ran some scenarios through the Great Depression. You know, what if we had market returns during the Great Depression, if this plan was enacted? And when the account balances get to a certain level in the term in, in a deep market correction there are automatic loans that kick in interest-free loans against the account to sustain the account at a certain level until a, a correction or a, a recovery comes. We think that the fact that a trillion dollars will be flowing into the equity markets every year would also kind of mitigate some of the volatility because you'd be buying, people would be buying in ups and downs all the way through it. And we think it would, that would serve to uh, mitigate some of the volatility and um, uh, th those are some of the things that we think would uh, would help those concerns you spoke about. I don't know if you think those would be, if you agree with that. Those are all important things. And another thing that's also uh, another thing in the plan's favor is it's able to actually work those financing mechanisms without actually dipping into the principal. Yes. Without actually dipping into the initial contributions. And so everything comes out of flows rather than stocks, which is which is a crucial thing to keep it sustainable. So. All of that's definitely in its favor. Uh, you can definitely see, though, how tricky the political transition process is going to be. You yes. have to build. You have to build the political coalition. You have to convince representatives and senators on both sides of the aisle that this is in their self-interest to to pursue. Presumably, it's going to take several years to actually facilitate that transition, and so you have to stop the usual horde of special interest descending on the thing to try and take their cut and change the plan here and there to make sure that it benefits them a little bit more. But these are all things that all transition plans face. So it's not necessarily a strike against Plan for America. The only quote unquote strike against it is the sheer ambition of it is yes. going to make it a tempting target for political opportunists. But frankly, nothing short of something that ambitious is going to fix our fiscal scenario. Right, 150 trillion in the red in terms of unfunded liabilities is actually in the middle of the estimates. It could actually be higher than that. That's why they're called unfunded liabilities. We don't know. Lawrence Kotlikoff, an economist at New York University, uh, thinks it could be as much as 210 trillion, which is approximately three years worth of world GDP. Just think about that, right? Right now, the present discounted value of Uncle Sam's net position in the red is three years worth of the economic output of the whole world. If that doesn't frighten you, I'm not quite sure what else would frighten you. So, yeah, I haven't heard it put that way. So, uh, wow. Hope our, our viewers and listeners are sitting down. <laughs> That's why I'm sitting down for the course of this podcast, right? Because when you start really thinking on these numbers, you think, my God, how, go how long can this go on? Right. Uh, and that's why people, I think, give up and don't think there's nothing that can be done, but there can yeah. be. And what we're trying to do is get the word out. And this podcast is one way, create a groundswell of support because the goodies are better than the current system for all parties. And that's the thing that hopefully will be compelling to move it forward because the retirement is better than what you get from Social Security. The health care is better than what you get from Medicare. And the government gets relieved from these burdens which are unsustainable so it, it took a lot of work to uh, come up with this but um, hopefully we can we can move it forward sure and one of the I talked about political difficulties I'll talk a little bit about political virtues what I like about the plan for America white paper that just sort of lays out the big picture approach to the program and also in the appendix gets into the nitty-gritties of the arithmetic where you can check sensitivity and all that stuff what I like a lot about this is that it makes the right marginal reforms to the existing system. Mm. So it doesn't completely try and eliminate transfer programs, social security, Medicare, Medicaid payments out of paychecks. It re-diverts those funds to a more productive use. 
So that necessarily means that there are going to be people on board in the political coalition that wouldn't otherwise be there if you were trying to either up that or finagle with it some other way or even get rid of it entirely. The simple yeah. fact of the matter is that the status quo is where we start from. And regardless of whether Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid are good or bad in the abstract, regardless whether looking back, we would have said, Psh, if we had known, we never would have do that. We never would have done this. Yeah. Well, guess what? We did do it. We start from here. There are vested interests in keeping the system the way it is, and those interests have a right to be at the table on the political democratic bargaining process in terms of making marginal reforms that can actually improve the welfare for all stakeholders. That's just that's the way it has to happen in a democracy. Yeah, and uh, we have to begin somewhere, as, as you point out, so. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Any, anything else you'd like to add? Anything else that strikes you about the plan? I think that that gets the uh, that gets the meat of it. Mm -hmm. Again, what I like mo what I like most about it is that all the assumptions are very above board. The arithmetic checks out, and it does it with the right marginal tweaks to the existing system, which I don't necessarily think means it's going to be an easy sell. Right? There's a reason that oh, no. these the, that these programs are called the third rail of American politics. <laughs> But I think at some point, once you get a critical mass of American citizens, ordinary Americans, who realize under the current program, I'm earning 4% less in my retirement fund under Social Security per year, right, compounded for 30 plus years than I could under some alternative feasible system. That's a huge difference, right? Just sit down and plug that number into your calculator or even just go on Google and figure out what happens to that number when you compound it, right? A 4% difference in rates of return yes. over 30 years. We're talking massive amounts of capital. It's good we for are. Americans who can be more secure in their retirement. It's good for capital markets that are going to see access to resources that are going to help finance productivity, enhancing investments. There's a lot to like. There's a lot to like. Well, thank you very much. And we particularly think the millennial generation is going to be interested in this because what's happening now is a wealth transfer from them to the retired generation. There's going to be nothing left for them in the future. And so we think they really would want this. And that's what we're trying to make a groundswell of support. And every U.S. citizen would be a stakeholder in our economy because they'd be owners of corporate America. That's right. And that would also unify us as well. So anyway, um, Dr. Salter, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for- Oh being yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you, Eric. And um, please join us next time for another edition of Plan for America podcast. All right, that's a wrap. Excellent. If you like what you're hearing and want to learn more about Plan for America, visit our website at www.planforamerica.us. There's an extensive Q&A section there. And if you don't see a question you have, then please ask us by email. You can order our book, Plan for America, How to Place the American Dream on a Sure Foundation Forever. That can be found on Amazon.com. You can like us on Facebook. And if you really like what you're hearing, you can, you're welcome to contribute through our website. Plan for America is a nonprofit 501c3 organization, and all contributions are tax deductible.